Welcome to our next episode of Jim and Java. Hi everyone, I'm Jim Dempsey and welcome to this latest installment of Jim and Java where we help nonprofit organizations increase their income and take their organization to the next level. If increasing income is important to your nonprofit organization, consider subscribing to this channel and hit the like button. If you've got questions for Jim and Java, we answer those weekly. You can go to Twitter at DevFStrats and use the hashtag Jim and Java. And you can also email me at developmenteffectivenessm at gmail.com. Our first question today is from Ken in Nashville, Tennessee. And Ken asks, what are your latest findings from this spring with regard to in-person versus virtual events? Well, thanks, Ken, for that question. I appreciate that. Well, we've really found some very interesting uh, findings this uh, latest year with regard to our virtual events. Last spring, everyone transitioned, pivoted to virtual events. And of course, from our standpoint, uh, that was we really didn't have any other choice. There wasn't any other option. In fact, the idea of even putting together a virtual event seemed unusual at the time, but it turned out to be the best decision for everyone. Uh, just about every organization who had a virtual event seemed to do so much better with that, uh, that event than not doing it at all. Many had 50%, some rare exceptions had 75% of what they normally get. Uh, on average, we saw about 25%. Uh, a lot of it depended on the quality of production. Um, we found that those organizations that actually did some live uh, Q&A at the end of that seemed to do even better where the audience could interact and ask questions. As we moved into the fall, we started to see uh, on a number of my videos, I mentioned what we call YouTube or Zoom fatigue. And we really saw that kind of kicking in last fall as more and more people started to get dissatisfied or disinterested with the virtual options. And it got more and more difficult for organizations to get viewers to participate, um, to register first off, and secondly, to actually watch the night of. Many organizations, uh, many teams, many movements that had 150, 200, maybe even 300 people watching in the spring of 2020, uh, all of a sudden some teams started dropping to um, 50, 60, even down to 30 or 20 uh, people participating in the fall. And of course, with less viewers uh, meant less money eventually came in. Um, some made up some of that money by putting the video out on YouTube uh, right after the broadcast on YouTube and started pushing that so that people would consider giving a gift as a result of that. And certainly that helped a lot. Um, we also tried the concept of watch parties this fall and we really saw that that was not what we expected. Uh, we hoped that people would just easily agree to be watch party hosts, open their home to individuals to watch the video broadcast with their friends. And it actually turned out to, to be somewhat of a dud, to be honest, um, from the standpoint that we ended up not, uh, not having the same positive effect that we have with a table host for a dinner. Uh, even though it can sometimes be challenging and difficult to get a table host to fill their table for a live event, we found that it was even more difficult to get someone to agree to be a watch party. First of all, someone had to agree to be willing to open up their home in the middle of a pandemic. And even though we, towards the fall, we started to see that more and more um, facilities were opening up and larger gatherings were occurring, even five, 10 or 15 people in a home was still a little risky for a lot of people in different parts of the country. And so that was the first obstacle. The second obstacle was the additional work. Even if people agreed to come to their home, it meant that someone had to clean their house, prepare at a minimum beverages, maybe hors d'oeuvres, and in some cases, people even wanted to prepare meals for their friends. And then on top of that, they wanted to have a program that would 
possibly outline testimonials from individuals who were impacted by the organization, at the least have a discussion topic, and quite possibly even a leader from the organization come in and speak at the watch party. So that took a lot of effort, a lot more than just asking someone to come to a dinner where their meals provided and, and, and they are really essentially entertained for the rest of the evening. So those were very difficult. Now, as we started to move into the spring of 2021, what we started to realize was that more and more organizations were willing to at least do some small gatherings. And even though the numbers were limited, that meant a fraction of the number of people who had come in the past. A 600 person dinner that uh, would uh, normally yield a fairly significant amount of money um, was only able to have maybe 75, 100, 150 people uh, come together. And then on the flip side, there were just countless organizations that had to just have a second virtual event. But the positive thing that came out of it was that I did not have one organization this spring that ventured out and had an in-person event actually have a negative experience. Everyone raised significantly more money than they did the year before with their virtual event, and many even came very close, if not superseded the amount of money that they raised with uh, twice as many people two years ago. Uh, an example of that is that I had an organization in Kansas City, for example, that a few years back had uh, 250 to 300 people in 2019 did a virtual event last year and actually did a really great job with their video in 2020. But they came back a few weeks uh, ago in uh, spring of 2021 and they were only able to get about 120 people into a local church. Uh, which in most cases I don't normally recommend churches as venues for uh, dinners, but in this situation, in this particular location, they really couldn't get any other venue that would allow as many as 120 people. But they raised over $111,000, which was significantly more than uh, they raised for their virtual event and even more than they raised with 250 to 300 people in 2019. So uh, I had examples like that that really seem to indicate that there is somewhat of what I refer to as pent up giving out there. Individuals who were desperate to be part of a live gathering to get together with people again and they rewarded the organization with their giving. And uh, we saw some significant increases with those individuals who just simply did something, for, something in person and it made a big difference. Now on the flip side, what we saw for a lot of organizations that did a second year virtual event, and again, they really didn't have many alternatives, uh, but I think unfortunately what some organizations felt was that they had such a positive response in 2020 um, that they got a little confident and they thought, well, maybe we can continue to do a virtual event uh, all the time going forward. And one event in particular had a significant drop um, for a... Um, for a very, very worthy cause. And they, they probably were 50% uh, on the income that was raised the year prior in 2020. And so um, I've had that happen almost across the board that the number of viewers and the amount of, raise, amount of money raised in 2021 was less than the amount of money raised in 2020. And so it, the bottom line was that if you were one of those organizations that were able to do something in person and you ventured out and were able to do it, and again, I know that there were local governments and state governments that wouldn't allow you to even meet this spring, but those who did and did venture out were rewarded well by that and uh, did, did extremely well uh, by having an in-person gathering. So Ken, I hope that helped, and those are some of the findings we had. Our next question is from Patty in Baltimore. And Patty asks, what are your thoughts about corporate sponsorship of events? Well, I've mentioned at different times, I've even written some articles for uh, publications about corporate sponsorships. And having corporations or businesses help your organization with a gift or with funds is not a bad thing. 
Unfortunately, what happens is that too many organizations use that corporate funding for what I call the wrong reasons. And what we have found over the years in so many of our events is that using corporations to sponsor or underwrite events especially tend to have the opposite reaction and opposite response. A lot of times an organization will ask a corporation to underwrite or sponsor uh, and use that sponsorship almost as a um, endorsement that this is a good organization and they expect individuals in the seats to give as a result of that corporate sponsorship. Unfortunately, what we find that happens is that the individual in the seats sees that money and thinks, well, if they've got these corporations and these organizations helping, they don't need my money and they don't need my gift. And so it actually backfires on the organization. Now, normally the reason a nonprofit organization goes to a corporation and goes to uh, a, um, a, a, a business to get sponsorship and to get underwriting is to help cover the cost, especially the initial costs of deposits and the money to help to fund the meals for that event. And so in, in thinking, in theory, it's a good idea, but unfortunately what happens is that all that really does is it takes some of the stress off the nonprofit organization in knowing that they can go into the dinner without a lot of debt and they go in there looking for mostly profit if they get enough corporate sponsorship. But a lot of times what happens is number one, they don't get enough corporate sponsorship uh, to underwrite all the costs, but number two, once again, using the corporation's underwriting or sponsorship actually causes the people in the seats to not want to give. So it is actually a disincentive to give. So what happens is that organizations go in with their expenses covered at 50% or 75%, expecting to get all the rest being profit. And what happens is a very few of those individuals will give as a result of that. It's the exact same way with charging someone for an event, and we'll talk about that on another broadcast. But from the standpoint of corporate sponsorship, if you feel like you want to use the benefit of a corporation for your dinner or for your event, use them as partners. Don't use the term underwriter or sponsors. Use them as partners. And most corporations will not mind the name change from uh, or the term change from underwriter and sponsor to partner. Uh, listing partners has a different connotation. That connotation is that this corporation or organization comes alongside us, but doesn't necessarily imply that they actually funded the event. And so that is one way if you are just firmly committed or your dinner has survived over time with underwriting or corporate sponsorship. Shifting them to be partners with you uh, could have a positive impact on you versus just completely eliminating that altogether, which would be the other alternative. So I hope, Patty, that helped answer your question. Uh, thank you again for watching, for listening. If you aren't a subscriber to this channel, please hit the subscribe button, share these with your friends, and of course, um, if you need to reach me, please do so at developmenteffectivenessm at gmail.com, and as I always say, we'll help you to increase your income and reach the goal of becoming fully funded. Thank you.